Hello and welcome back to the channel. Some of you may recall last summer I was at Oxford University through a work study program from my grad school and many of us decided to get together again this summer but I thought I would check out a different college. Last year I was at Exeter College but this year I wanted to check out this one, Christ Church College, if nothing else because of its sheer size. This place is just massive. Now it's hard to get in here unless you have official business, but it turns out there is a way to get in if you apply to certain work-study programs and thought, I thought I'd give it a shot. Now Christ Church College was originally founded by Cardinal Thomas Wolsey and its original name was Cardinal College. Now Wolsey had some ambitious ideas. For one thing, he wanted to make the largest college in the world, and I don't know if he succeeded, but this place is pretty big. He also had an idea for a different kind of teaching. So back 500 years ago, there wasn't a lot that you could learn, but he had this idea that they should teach new things, including Latin and Greek in their original languages. New ideas at the time. He decided to call this new idea Humanities. Now back in 1524, there were 101 students in this college, and even today this bell tower behind me, whose name is Tom, by the way, still tolls 101 times each night at 9 p.m., that's the original curfew time, in commemoration of those original 101 students. Now for those of you with an astronomy angle, it doesn't exactly toll at 9 p.m. It does so at 9.04 p.m. because of our distance from Greenwich, that is GMT time. So we're here at the Peckwater Quad, one of the other quadrangles here at the school. Now today this place is used for classrooms and dormitories, but back in the day, you know, today you get a classroom or a dorm and you get one room. Back in the day, you used to have four or five rooms, and it was a place where gentry could stay while waiting for their turn to take over the family estate. Not a bad place to spend some time. Now, Robert Peel was one of the school's most famous graduates, one of the 13 prime ministers educated at the school. You'll see this door says, no Peel. Well, at the time, Peel had some very controversial op opinions about Catholic emancipation. I'll let you read all about it. So around here, his views on Catholics put him at odds with the administration, both in England and with the administration here at Oxford as well. As a result, pro-Peel and anti-Peel factions formed here, and those lively debates ensued. Well, one day, members of the anti-Peel faction hammered the words no peel into this door today and it stood for several hundred years. Now they chose the location well. If you've seen where this is on campus, you can't help but pass this location several times each day. As an aside, the college gift shop sells a house blend marmalade in both peel and no peel variants. You know, there are so many of these stunningly beautiful gardens here. I've lost track as to how many there are. This one is referred to the student garden and it's on the back side of the school. And it's a place reserved for students where they can come and play. And one of the most common activities they do here is of course, croquet. So Oxford here isn't actually set up like a lot of colleges you may be familiar with in the Western world where you have one building and one quadrangle where people gather. No, the term Oxford is actually a collective sort of umbrella term encompassing some 40 or so semi-autonomous colleges. This one, of course, is Christchurch, the largest of them and one of the most prestigious as well. Depending on who you listen to, it's somewhere between 140 to 170 acres. And I'll tell you, wandering around here, it feels a lot bigger than that. I've been walking around here for days now, and every once in a while I'll find a complete meadow or garden or a walkway or someplace that I'd never noticed before. Now, Cardinal Wolsey never lived to see his creation come to fruition. He died before about half of this place was assembled here. No, the completion of this college fell under the auspices of a certain King Henry VIII. So a couple of questions I've been getting here. Are there elevators and is the place air-conditioned? Uh, 
No, pretty much no. I mean, the front office is air-conditioned and there's a lift going to the dining hall, which is up on the second floor, but this place is 500 years old and just looking around, I mean, I'm sure anything's possible, but I think air-conditioning this whole place would be a pretty difficult engineering undertaking. Now, this place is so old, the steps here are actually worn down and they've actually had to paint white stripes on the steps to keep you from tripping over them. So there's a garden behind the main square here, the Tom Square, and it's called the Cathedral Garden. Against the back wall of this garden, there is a door with a keyhole in it. One day, math professor Charles Dodson was watching the daughter of the dean bending down and looking through the keyhole of that door. And he imagined what she was imagining as she was looking through the keyhole. Charles Dodson's pen name was Lewis Carroll, and the girl's name was Alice. Now Alice's parents being the dean, she could only follow him up to that door because only deans are allowed past that entrance there. So she had to peer after him into the keyhole. And the dean, her father, well, he was always late. Perpendicular to that wall is another wall here that has a very small door in it. And there was a, an official here who needed to get from here to Merton College, which is down the road here. It's a little bit of a walk, but it's complicated by the fact that there are these giant college squares in the way and you have to kind of go around them. So he got permission to put that door in there so that he could walk in between the squares and that door is sometimes referred to as the Royal Shortcut. Now in the next garden, there is a giant tree here and this is referred to as an Oriental Plain Tree. Now these trees by themselves aren't terribly rare, but this one is interesting for two reasons. Number one, it's age. This tree goes back to the year 1624. You're looking at a 400 year old tree here and you can see its branches are being supported artificially at this point. The second reason it's interesting is Charles Dodson, Lewis Carroll, was walking by this garden one day and was intrigued by the shadows of the branches that were cast on the ground and he based Jabberwocky upon it. This is also alleged to be the tree where the Cheshire cat used to sit. So here's the dining hall, and the picture really doesn't do this place justice. It is even bigger in person than it appears in this photograph. Almost everybody stops at the entrance for the first time and gasps, and almost everyone takes a picture. Now, if you look very carefully at this dining hall, you may have think that you've seen this thing before, and you have. The Dwight Hall at Hogwarts from the Harry Potter series is based on this particular building. Here they are side by side and you can see the similarities in architecture. Dinners here are formal. You show up at your table and you stand. You stand until the headmaster bangs the gavel, reads an invocation and grace in Latin, in which case after we all say Amen, we sit down and eat. Now at the end of the hall there, there is a high table. Now it's not actually all that high, it's about three steps higher than the rest of the floor, but it's a place of honor and that's where the headmaster and your professors sit. So here it is a tradition that at least once in every visit, every student goes up and sits at the high table for at least one night. My night was a few nights ago, and when you do get up there, it is traditional that you do not enter the high table area unless you are in formal dress, it is considered polite to make pleasant conversation, and it is also considered polite to compliment your professors on the job that they are doing. The quality of the food here is excellent. In fact, it's so good, I actually was starting to dare one of my colleagues here, yeah, go up to one of the waitstaff and start demanding a hamburger. <laughs> but take a look at some of the food here. I, mean, I don't even recognize some of this stuff. I'm looking at the menu and I don't even know sometimes what we're having for dinner when I see the menu, but the food, it was just outstanding. Now it's another tradition at the end of your class on the final dinner, it is a formal dinner again, that you sit together with your class and your professor where it is again considered polite to compliment your professor on the job that they're doing. And it's also customary to buy them a card and to give them a small tip. Yeah, I wasn't prepared for that one. I had to get some cash for that. So as part of an archeology span class I took here, we went over to Stonehenge. Now going to a place like Stonehenge it's so iconic, so embedded in our consciousness. It's kind of like going to the Grand Canyon or seeing the Mona Lisa. It's kind of hard to see the thing with fresh eyes. Now these hinges, these circular monuments, 
They're virtually unknown outside of England and Ireland, but they have hundreds of them here. Why? What was their purpose? Could they be monuments to a religion? Could they be places to bury the dead? Could they be astronomical markers of some kind? Might be a combination of all of those things. Might mean none of those things. They didn't leave any kind of written record or marker as to why they built these things, so we have to try to figure it out. We might never know, but you know, that doesn't stop us from trying. Now, Stonehenge is a prehistoric ruin that goes back to about 4,500 years ago. And if you get there, there's a couple of things that might surprise you. First of all, Stonehenge, as we know it, that circle of stones, is actually a very small part of a much larger area, spreading miles in each direction. Also, Stonehenge itself, the circle of stones, is much smaller than you might think looking at the pictures. Now, we did the walk from the visitor center, and from there, it's almost two miles over to the Stonehenge monument itself. Here's a photograph from about halfway up this Circus, which is this long, thin walkway that's got borders on it. You can't really see the borders from where you are, but from the air or from a distance, they do show up. Can you even see Stonehenge in the distance? Well, there it is. It never seems to get any closer. Now, when you get to Stonehenge, a lot of this is roped off. They don't want people getting too close to it. A couple of definitions here. There are sarsen stones. Those are the vertical pieces of stones. And the lintels are the horizontal pieces at the top. You can see from the picture here, there are both sarsen and lintel stones that are missing. Now, look very closely, and you can see that sarsen stone, the very tallest one at the very end, it's missing its horizontal lintel piece at the top. But that's okay because we've learned something here. You can see a notch at the top where the lintel would have gone. Now, early drawings of Stonehenge will show that particular sarsen stone leaning. That has been changed. They have fixed it and made it upright. And if you look closely, you'll see some other restoration work done here as well. You know, whenever they do that, preservationists and purists do have some concerns about doing that. Some people feel that they should just leave it as is. Now, during the solstice, they do let people in here for various reasons, but during normal business hours and visitors' hours, we could only get so close. Here's a picture of our archaeology class. Now, if you go back to the visitor center through the Circus Walk, it's about another two miles back, and only then do you see the true genius of Stonehenge. You can only exit through the gift shop.